Good morning. Well, welcome to the Daniel Plan, and uh, we're going to go through a series for the next six weeks and uh, focusing on aspects of it. Uh, however, we are going to do it differently to what we have done it in the past. We have um, run this, al um, I said alpha there, uh, <laughs> run this uh, Daniel Plan um, a number of times previously. Uh, however, what I found is that um, uh, that once we end the season, it slowly we gradually swerve downwards, sl swerve to rot, as it were. So, um, because we have been depending more on uh, our, uh, ourselves and uh, or even our connect group, so what we're doing is we're forming a new ministry uh, called the Daniel Plan Ministry. It's probably more of a more of a movement than a ministry in some ways, but um, which is where those that are part of it will support one another and um, and enable it, and we'll, there'll be ongoing uh, support, ongoing teaching, ongoing interaction. It's going to be uh, fantastic, so I'm really looking forward to that. So <coughs> the opportunity is for you to listen to these, and you will discuss some of the aspects in your connect group, but really... It's about signing up to this ministry if you want to be a part of it. So it's a choice, yes? And uh, you get to choose uh, whether or not you want to be a part of uh, this Daniel Plan ministry. It is based on the book uh, by uh, Rick Warren, Daniel Amen, and Mark Hyman. These three uh, did it together. And uh, it's a fantastic book. You can't read that without learning something. It is uh, It is. Just on itself, it will do that. Now, I know it can be, to a certain extent, heavy reading. Um, it's full of facts. It's l full of all sorts of information. Um, it really is quite packed, uh, uh, you know, but it will really... I can assure you, you won't put this down um, and be the same again. You might go back to your old habits, of course, eventually, but it will certainly change you in the process and will help you... Uh, in that, and of course, as we support one another, it will help. There are things like the Daniel Plan Journal, uh, which you can do. Um, again, they're all optional, and uh, for those that go on uh, in the ministry, there will be a group thing which we will do together, as well as uh, part of that, as well as other things. We will have a, a Daniel Plan Jump Start as well that we'll go through, uh, which will be, unfortunately, it will be very expensive. It is a good 49 pence. So if you can afford that, you can maybe be part of the ministry, yes. Um, so we're developing that. There's a number of us that are involved in that. So as the weeks go by, we will share that. And um, I just want to share a few things this week. And then in the weeks that follow, we will have some testimonies and some talks from uh, the rest of the, uh, the team members. It is based, the Daniel plan, on Daniel in the Bible. Um, not by anybody else is called Daniel. Um, and so the whole principle of his being Daniel strong. Now, in the book of Daniel, uh, he was based in the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire had taken over the whole world at the time. And the king at the time was a guy called Nebuchadnezzar. And uh, he had taken all of the Jewish people and he had taken everyone from from the land of Israel, and he had taken them to, uh, to Babylon. And there he asked that he could get the, uh, the, the, the best of the young men. He wanted those that were clever, that were skillful, the kind of, he wanted the cream of the crop. And he wanted to put them into his mentoring program so that in future they would be guys who would be able to actually advise the king. And so uh, he was, as, as even they do today, uh, governments still often do that. They want to get the best from around the world. They want to attract them. And, and as a country, we do the same. And I know that some of you are here because of the attractions um, that have been offered because of what we have as a country. And so Daniel and his friends, of course, didn't have a choice in this, uh, unlike uh, you've had a choice of where, where you live. Um, <clears throat> and so they had gone into captivity for 70 years, and, um, and Daniel, along with, particularly in this story, is along with three friends. And the three friends are called Hananiah, Michelle, and uh, Azariah. Now, <clears throat> I, I remember them more because of their Babylonian names than I do because of their Jewish names. 
And, uh, and Daniel was referred to as Belshazzar, and his three friends were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which I often remember as shake your bed, make your bed, and go to bed, okay? <laughs> Um, but Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three guys, and we know later on in the book of Daniel that they have great courage, uh, they have great um, faith in God and who he is. But this is what it's, it's based on. And so these guys go through the plan, but they realize these parts of the plan that, 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 that are, are not what they kind of want to go through uh, for various different uh, reasons. But one of the perks of being in this plan of the King Nebuchadnezzar in his mentoring program was that you would eat the finest of foods. You'd eat immense, you know, brilliant delicacies and wine. You'd have things that the rest of the population wouldn't have. But Daniel um, didn't want to uh, spoil his body. He wanted to live a healthy because of his faith in God. And, uh, and so therefore he said, well, to the, to the guy that was the boss of the mentoring program, he said, well, give us a test and we will not eat these. We will just eat fruit and vegetables, as it were. Uh, we won't eat all these delicacies. And, uh, and so that's what we've done this week. We've done, for, for most of us, I think, we've done a Daniel um, fast. Yes, in other words, we've tried to say to God, we're not going to eat the delicacies that we normally would have and, um, and, and eat uh, healthily, even if it is just for a week, <laughs> okay? Um, so we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 1. And it says this, the king assigned them a daily ration of the best and rich foods and wines from his own kitchen. They were to be trained for a three-year period. Then some of them would be, would be made advisors of the royal court. Daniel, Ananiah, Michelle, uh, and Azariah were four men chosen from the tribe of Judah. But Daniel made up his mind not to defile himself by eating the king's rich food and wine. So he asked for permission to eat other things instead. In other words, he wanted a healthy lifestyle. The chief official was alarmed by Daniel's suggestion. He said, the king's ordered you to eat his food and his wine. If he sees you looking worse than the other men, he'll execute me for neglecting my duties. So Daniel came up with a plan. And this is what he said. He said, let us eat a healthy diet of vegetables and water then at the end of 10 days, see how healthy we four are compared to the other young men who are eating the king's rich foods. Then you can decide whether or not to let us continue eating our diet. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion. At the end of 10 days, Daniel and his three friends not only looked healthier, but they were better nourished than the young men who had been eating the rich foods. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables and fresh foods instead of the rich foods and the wines. This is the story that the Daniel plan is based upon. Now, the Daniel plan has a number of principles, and one of the principles is that it's about abundance, not deprivation. It's about eating a lot, not about eating a little. And so often we, feel, we find that in often, you know, some of the diet plans out there, it's kind of eat for five days and then fast for two days. Or it's kind of watch what you eat. And for some of them, they actually make their own pre-packed foods um, for you to buy because it's a point system. So there's all sorts of, of things out there. But, um, but this is not about that. This is not like that. This is about abundance, not deprivation. It's about adding in um, uh, the good, taking out the bad. In other words, it's about replacing things um, so often because when you take something out, you need to put something good in. It's like if you stop a bad habit, put a good habit in its place. And so that's what we want to do. The second principle is small steps will make a big impact. So it's not about a big thing, you've got to kind of do all this and I've changed my whole diet overnight. It's about doing some small steps and working on it together and helping each other in the process. You see, little habits change lives. It will change your life just doing some little small changes. The third principle, it's about progress, not perfection. It's just about making some little small steps of progress in it. So even a bad day can be, a good, can be good data. In other words, if you reflect on why did I have a bad day today, why did I do such and such, and you think about, reflect on it, 
um, you know, then you can learn from that and it can help you for the future. So even bad days can be helpful um, for, for us in this. And the fourth principle is we have got to shift our mindset is one of the main things about this is changing the way we think about food, changing the way you think about some of the things that you eat and recognizing what they are for themselves, yes? But you've got to think of food as medicine. In other words, your food will either heal or hurt you. And that's what we so often forget is what we, I, I, I uh, sometimes have problems with my stomach with wind. And uh, I have a little tablet. It's hardly, I mean, I can hardly get hold of it. It is so small. I think it's called Windies or something like that. It's so tiny. But if I eat that little tiny thing, it can make a world of difference to my stomach. So, all, and now that's man-made, obviously, and that's, that's, uh, that's a medicine. But all I'm saying is, is, is what we eat can dramatically change us. You only need a right little small bit of arsenic and it'll kill you. You don't need to have a lot, do you? So in other words, you can, you can, if I had a glass here, which I happen to have, and I was to put one drop of poison in there, would you be happy to drink the water that's in that glass? Why? Because the poison is in the whole glass, isn't it? It's not like, oh, well, I'll, I'll miss that bit of poison there. I won't, I won't. It's gone. And that's what happens in the food that we have. A lot of the food that we have has toxins in us. They, they are poisonous to us. They are destroying us. They are hurting us. They are causing us uh, problems. So let me ask you a question. If Jesus came for dinner to your house, what would you feed him? The king of the universe who created all things, what would you feed him? Would you feed him a burger? <laughs> Adam's going, yes. <laughs> you would give him the best that you have. And that's what God is saying to us. I want you to eat and to do the things that's best for you. That's what he's wanted. So the aspect for us is, we want you to leave the food that man has made and to eat the food that God has made. Eat the food that God has made. Don't eat the food that's been made in a factory. We often say in the Daniel Plan, one of the nice phrases is, if it comes from a plant, eat it, but if it's made in a plant, don't eat it. You see, factory made science projects that are made in industrial buildings, that are empty of real nutrition, that are hyper-palatable, hyper-addictive, hyper-processed, of foods that hijack our metabolism, our brain chemistry, our taste buds, and rob us of our health and vitality. <coughs> you only have to look around, probably in this room, but you look at us as a nation, you can see that obesity is a major problem. It's not just a major problem in adults, it's a major problem in our children. So many people actually have pre-diabetes but don't realize that they have it. And that is probably some of you. But the good news today is it can be fixed. It can be changed. It can be turned around. And so, if you, uh, I don't know if you put the picture up of the fruit basket for me, thank you. This is what I mean by fresh fruit and vegetables, lean protein, chicken, fish, nuts, eggs, seeds, etc. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you feel energetic or do you feel tired? Are you feeling exhausted? Are you feeling weary? You see, so many people have got CFS, which is chronic fatigue syndrome. Now, <clears throat> if you put up the next picture for me, Adam, please. The problem is, is so often, is we look to doctors to rectify the problems that we have caused ourselves by the things that we have eaten. Now, we have holistic doc doctors, yes? They are doctors who treat a whole list of uh, symptoms. Did you get that one? Uh, holistic, 
whole list of, okay, there you go. The thing with the Daniel plan, it can reverse the curse on our health. The Daniel plan uses the most powerful drug known to mankind. The Daniel plan uses a drug that no other drug can compare to. And it's on the end of your fork. It's the food that you eat. No other drug works so well. No other drug is as cheap. It has no side effects except good ones. What we eat dramatically affects how we eat. The Daniel plan is really a roadmap. It's a toolkit to get your health back in to the right way. So the key to success is to let go of the bad and to take hold of the good. I saw these statistics by Mark Hyman and uh, he was saying that they had done this study and where they had changed people that, that were coming with all the symptoms that you'd seen on the other slide and uh, they, they did just for 10 days, they ate fresh, healthy food, the food that we saw in the basket and he saw that and he said within 10 days they saw a 62% reduction in symptoms from all diseases. Wow, eh? That, that just blows your mind. I want to tell you there's no other drug on the planet that can do that. It doesn't matter what you take, the Daniel plan and the foods of eating healthily will change your health and vitality. We see, you and I don't need another diet plan, but we do need a new way of thinking. We need new knowledge, new friends to support us and to help us through this. So that's what the Daniel plan is based upon. And so today, I want to talk about an aspect of physical health that you won't hear about in any diet plan. I'm going to talk about God's prescription for health, which will so often, for many of you, may have never heard about God's prescription for health. But if you will put God's prescription in to, in, in, into, into your life, it will make you healthy because God's promised it in the way that he will do it. You see, <coughs> the truth is we all really know what to do. We all, most of us, I would think, know what we ought to eat and what ought not to eat. We all, ought to, we all really know the exercise we ought to do, but we don't do it, do we? We all have this kind of thing. So, we all know we ought to eat healthily and we ought to exercise. We need to have enough rest and sleep. I mean, just not having enough sleep will make you obese because it lowers your willpower. You get tired, you get exhausted. Sleep itself is powerful um, in itself. And so if you've got stress in your life, that's going to affect you in your life. And so today I want to talk about the motivation, the why behind living healthily, the why of what we ought, why we ought to look after our bodies, why we don't keep to the diet plans, why we don't keep to our exercise dreams, why do we not do that? You see, if you're like me, many of you have probably set New Year's resolutions, uh, like I said last, uh, last week, we probably set a re New Year's resolution and then We've not accomplished it. In fact, probably within, they say, within about 26 days, I think it is, most people have started and finished whatever their New Year's resolution, they've dropped it. But even if you've got great willpower and you keep it going, let's, let's say how many of you started something and then not completed? For the simple reason we're trying to do it in our own strength. We've not got the, or the right motivation for it. So we've got to have the right motivation, the right reasons to do what we do. So this morning I want to talk about the why. Why you need to be healthy. Why you need to look after your body from God's perspective, yes? So I want to share just a couple of areas for health that you may never have thought of, but you certainly won't find in a nutritional book. And they come from 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you should have this on your outline, it is the classic passage on the body. Yes? And it starts with this. It says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Yes? In other words, everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. God is saying that some things in life are not necessarily wrong, they're just not necessary. You see, you may be free to do whatever you want, but not everything that you want to do is beneficial. And so the issue is like Paul, is to say to ourselves, I am not going to be mastered by anything else. I'm not going to be addicted to anything. It goes on, food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy both. They're not going to last forever. There is a greater destiny that God has for our bodies than what's in this life, than what you are looking at right now. The body, it goes on, is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. He's going to physically raise us from the dead. He's going to raise our bodies. If you're living, he's going to raise your body. He's going to transform your body. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Flee from sexual immorality. All of the sins a man commits are outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Jesus paid for your body. Therefore, honor God with your body. This passage teaches us six counter-cultural things, things that... This culture teaches the opposite to. And so I just want to quickly go through them. The first one is, the first thing that God expects of you is to manage your body. God expects you to manage your body. Why? Because you are not the owner. God is the owner of your body. You are the manager of your body. You are the steward. The Bible talks about stewardship, which is an old-fashioned word for manager. You are the manager of your body body. And so that's what we're talking about today. That's what we're talking about in the Daniel plan, about stewarding our body in a healthy way. So in other words, you and I cannot blame someone else for misusing our body, abusing our body, you know, because so often we want to blame someone else, but it's not. We are responsible for our body. Yes? We are responsible for how we use it, how we look after our body. You see, because our bodies are a gift from God. They're a precious gift from God, but it's on loan to you. It doesn't belong to you, it's, it's on loan. and You've got to see it as you are a steward of that. And one day, you and I are going to give an account for how we've used the things that God has given us. God has given us all sorts of things in life, but we are going to one day give an account, what have you done with what I've given you? He's also going to ask us another question, and that is, what have you done with my son Jesus? Yes, there are two things. There's a salvation question and a stewardship question. They're the two things. And you look all through the Bible, them two things go like a, like a, a scarlet thread right from the beginning to the end is about salvation and stewardship What do we do with the things that God has given us? One day, you and I will stand before God and give an account of how we have used our bodies, how we have treated our bodies. Because life is a test. Yes, it is preparation for eternity. And so God is looking at us, he's watching us, and he's saying, can I trust you with your body? Can I trust with what I've given you? Because when he can trust you with what he's given you, he can give you bigger things. Amen? And so let's remember that, that God expects us to manage our body. The second thing that the Bible teaches is that our body 
is not our property. Like I said, God's the owner. It's not ours. It doesn't belong to us. Our body is God's property. Now, in the UK, that's fighting talk. In the UK, we always know, we are taught growing up that your body is your own body, yes, and you can do with it whatever you want. You talk kind of, well, if you want to do that and it feels good and that's what you'd like to do, that's what you can do. I want to say to you, the Bible says, God says to you and to me, that's, that's not right. That's, that's, that's not, that's not uh, uh, the right way to think, yes? Because God says, no, your body belongs to him. He created it. He owns it. Yes, uh, he, he's the one that paid for it um, in, in every way. Because everything that you and I see belongs to God because he created it. Nothing is, is out of it. Well, you know, you might say, well, they created a TV screen or there's something like that. But they've only created it from what God has made, from the substance and the, 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 the materials that God has provided. And so we've got to understand that, that everything that we see is owned by God. Your money is God's money. It is not your, you have a stewardship for it, but it's not yours. And it's a mindset that changes. I want to say to you, if you can change this mindset, it will transform your life. But we struggle with this. And the amount of times I talk to people, I mean, we'll be doing a, a membership course soon. And one of the aspects of that, particularly talked about in the maturity course, is about tithing. And it's amazing, once you talk about money, how people go, oh, we've had people leave the church because they don't want to give. But it's because it's the mentality is, it's not about amount. God doesn't say an amount, he says a percentage. So it's, it's equal, it's even. Every one of us, it's even. So what I'm saying to you is God owns everything. Our body belongs to God. The body is not meant, it's, Paul says, for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. Why? Because it is his and the Lord for the body. In other words, we don't have a, have a right to share our body with whoever we want to share it with. Now, that is obviously a radical uh, um, uh, concept to us. And a lot of this comes from, particularly in the UK and various parts around the world, who have this kind of ancient Greek understanding and philosophy uh, of life that from the days of Aristotle and Plato and Socrates, the Greeks believed in dualism. They believed that your body and your spirit were separate. So in other words, um, you know, that the two were not, not joined together. So you could treat your body however you liked, but as long as your spirit was all okay, and that was in relation with God, and it was one with the universe or whatever, they would talk about it like that. And so I want to say to you that if your body affects your spirit, and God is interested in the two, you can't just say, I'm, all, I'm, I'm spiritual, and then you're misusing the body that God has given you. We have got to understand that the two is there, because what they did was they devalued the body. But God doesn't devalue the body. He honors the body. He, he's, he's really um, sold out on our body. And so we've got to realize that the body is not evil. The body is good. It is something that God created it. And because God made it, it has a purpose. And our purpose for, for him is to serve God. So can I say to you, don't compartmentalize your life. Don't compartment your life between the sacred and the secular. In other words, that the, I, I pray, but then I can go out and, and I can do what I like. And I can treat my body I like, or I can treat others how I like, or I can, I can do what I like, I can go where I like. You see, when we give our life to Jesus, we are on a different plane, we're on a different journey, we're on a different path, we're on a different course, we look different. It was funny, I was talking to... Um, a pastor from another church last week that was uh, visiting and he said about the, their church and uh, it says one of the things that they do um, is that they, they, they <laughs> it's quite a strange, but they say, okay, if they're on about 10, does, is somebody a Christian? They'll say, well, um, does it look like a duck? Does it quack like a duck? 
Does it walk like a duck? And does it eat like a duck? Well, in other words, do you look like a Christian in the things that you do? Do you, do you talk like a Christian? Do you walk like a Christian? Do you eat the devotional things that are Christian? In other words, your life will reflect it. Do you go to the place? It, it, it's a simple analogy. I don't know if it breaks down, but it's just that way. We've got to understand that sometimes some people are saying, I'm a Christian and I'm, I'm part, of the, part of the church, but we don't see you at church. Oh, we, uh, you kind of come in. There's so many people that date the church. The dating God, oh, I love God, God's great, and, and we, we like the week when I went, uh, you know, I can go home to do what I want to do, but then I'm going to get dressed up and I'm going to have some time with God, and, and I'm going to tell God how much I love Him, and then go and do my own thing again. Once you get married, the dating is, 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 a, is a past thing, it's now something that is, there's a commitment, there's a life together, there's doing this completely, and that's what God's saying, when you give your life to Jesus, there's a commitment. And it requires all sorts of things. And one of them is looking after our body. And so it's good for us to, to understand that. The third thing that this passage teaches is that your body will be resurrected after you die. Yes, <clears throat> your body and my body, if we've given our life to Jesus, will be resurrected. Either if we die, we will be resurrected. And if we stay and Jesus comes back while we're still alive, we will be raised up to be with him. Yes, I want to say to you, God has got a plan for your body. Yeah, and you are now living in version one. But there'll come a day when you'll be living in version two of, the, of, of, your, of your body. Now, some people think that when you go to heaven, you're going to kind of float around uh, in like a, a shapeless spirit or something. They, they have some weird ideas. Other people think that we're going to be angels. I want to say to you, you're not going to be an angel. Angels are angels and people are people. The two are very different, yes? And some people have this picture that heaven is going to be in all white. We're going to have this glow of white. I want to say to you, I don't know where you get that from, because God, from what I see of this world that God created, is multicolored, such variety, and things that they're still discovering, they're trying to go down the deepest seas to see things that they've never seen, that God created. I want to say to you, he is a multicolored, colored, multi-cultured, multi He this. Can you imagine, if this is a broken world, what heaven's going to be like? I, I want to say to you, I can't wait to see. We, they, they talk about uh, some of the things that go on, the beautiful things. And I, I love to watch some of the nature programs and the beauty. And then I want to say to you, I want to say to you that the new heaven and the new earth is going to be so far better. Why? Because it's going to be perfect. And you and I are going to be living in version two, which is perfect. It's not got the, the flaws and, and the problems and the difficulties and the hurts and the habits of all that. Can you imagine? I'm looking forward to that. So God is going to raise your body up. Amen. Amen. And I believe that's so important for us. 1 Corinthians 6 and verse 14, it says this. By his power, God raised the Lord Jesus from the dead and he might raise you up. He will raise you. Hallelujah. Glory to That's got to be something to praise him about, hasn't it? Yes. See how important your body is. Hallelujah. It's so important that one day Jesus is going to resurrect it. And you say to yourself, well, how is he going to do that? You know, uh, when, you know, it's going to decays and it's going to be buried or it's going to get cremated. How can God do that? I don't know. But he created it in the first place out of dust. You're telling me that God can't do a miracle? You're telling me that God can't do the supernatural? He can do what I can't understand for him to be done, but he will resurrect you. Yes. Now you might be asking, what's my resurrected body going to be like? Well, I want to tell you that I don't know. <laughs> but I do know this. 
that when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, he walked around Jerusalem for 40 days. He was seen by 500 people and he talked to many of them. In actual fact, he seemed to have a capability of dematerializing. In other words, he could be outside a building and he could walk through the wall. In the upper room, he, walked, he didn't come through the door, he came through. There was a, it's like Star Trek, he could just beam me up, Scotty. He had a different kind of body, but it was still there they still recognize that it was Jesus. In other words, we are going to know it's you in heaven. You're going to know it. You're going to go, that is Jonathan. I hope I'm living on the other. <laughs> You're going to recognize each other. I think that's fantastic. That's my understanding of it there because people recognize him. That to me is the, is the clue that we have. It's going to be version two. Yes, you know, like they go from Windows version 1 to version 2. I think they're up to 10 now. Well, God's not going to have a 10. He's going to have a version 1, which you see, and then he's going to have a version 2, yes? And it's going to be marvelous. It's like, you know, when you've had a computer for a few years and it gets all bogged and it gets slow and it gets thing and, and, and you feel like hitting it with a hammer and, and it gets, you know what I mean? There's going to come a point when you're going to get a brand new Apple Mac latest of the <laughs> you're going to get the latest the supersonically powered yes and you, can you imagine just living in that body because it's you that lives in that body it's, it's a body and so God, that's why God's interested in our character development because it's the, what we have in our character what we do with, with us if we take that with us amen by his power, God raised the Lord from the dead. God's power. That's why most of us don't stick with the diet plans, exercise programs, and all these kind of things, the goals that we set, because we're trying to do it with our willpower, not God's supernatural power. And so that's the, uh, a powerful reason for why we don't keep up. The, that's one of the mistakes that we have. You should have there three little things. Um, we use willpower instead of God's power. Now, you see, willpower works for about three weeks. Or if you're really good, it might last for longer. Some people are, uh, have really got a lot of willpower. But you get tired. And so then you, you drop off the diet. You drop off the exercise program. You, whatever it is that you, you're doing. You know, you decide to learn a language. You, you know, you drop it, whatever. Um, and so we're fantastic in the short term, but for the long term, we can't just keep forcing ourselves to do it. Because what happens eventually is we veer off course. I want you to imagine that you've got, um, uh, say, a speedboat and it has an autopilot. Now, if the autopilot's on, it will direct the boat in a certain thing. It's set up to go in a certain direction. Now, you could physically turn the wheel on that and cause the boat to go in a different direction. And, but the thing is, once you let go of that wheel, it will spin back to the original uh, course that it was set on. And that's what we're often doing with our lives, is we are, we are trying to turn our life with our willpower, trying to do it in our strength. We're trying to kind of say, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. And then the moment when we have a weekday and a bad day, we choo, and we go, I've just gone back. It's like having a spring. You know, you've got a spring. You can put it down and press it down. But the moment you take your hand off it, poof, it's up. And that's the problem is when we're trying to do it with our willpower, not God's power, we have got to learn to, to, to draw our energy from, uh, from God. Because if we try to do it on our own, we will be exhausted. The second reason we don't stick uh, with these programs is because we have the wrong motivation. When the goal is simply about me, that's not a big enough motivation to do it. We need something bigger than ourselves as a motivation. It nearly always takes a public uh, challenge, cause, or something for us to, to have some private victories. Now, the private victories set us up for public victories. But, and, uh, but the private victories are motivated by a public one. Do you know what I mean so often? In other words, we've got to have a big cause. It's got to be bigger than you. And I don't think there's a bigger cause than to live for God. If you can think of a bigger cause 
than to say, God's plan for my life, let me know about it, because I've never heard of one yet. Yes? So goals to feel good and look good are good, but they're not a great enough motivation uh, for, for us to keep it going. Appearance is not a big enough reason because the problem is, is once we get to the size we want to be, we stop. And then, of course, we get to a different shape we don't want to be, so we start again, and it's a bit of start, stop, start, stop, do you? yeah? Because we have not got the right motivation. We're not trying to live our life honoring God, yeah? But if we lived saying, I want to honor God by what I eat, you would stick at it because of that, not because of what size you are, what shape you are. Because the Daniel plan is not about losing weight. It's not about being a certain shape. It's being who God made you to be. That's what it's all about. And so we so often go back to our old habits and our old ways. The third reason why we don't stick uh, with the diets and the plans and the things that we've decided is because we try to change on our own. And I, I, I'm as guilty as everybody else <laughs> of all these, um, trying to do it on my own. And, um, and, and it, 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 just, it, it just doesn't happen. It might happen for a, for a while. And if you're really motivated, you can maybe make it last a lot longer. But even so, you don't. You see, you and I were made for community. We were made to be together. We were made to support one another. Yes, we weren't made to be lone rangers. We were made to live with accountability, with people who would partner with us in the journey of life, people who will coach us and help us and support us and sustain us. That's why, as a church, we insist on every person being in a small group. That's why, as soon as somebody comes through the door, we're, we're constantly, the first thing we're trying to do is we want to connect you into a small group community. Because if you will join a community and get connected, you will stick. And, and we have people that obviously join and then leave. But I want to say to you, they find it hard to leave. Once you're connected in community, it's not easy to leave. Yes, there's a tearing, there's a thing. It's, it's easier to stay in that community. And so it, we need each other if we're going to change. Yes, and once we get into that where we're on that, you know, you go into a, a rugby club, what are you going to do? You're not going to go and play cricket, are you? But you're going to get motivated to play rugby. So whatever it is, so in the Daniel plan, we're going to keep helping and motivating each other and helping each other to do that. So the fourth teaching from this passage in Corinthians is that uh, the body is connected to Christ. Our body is connected to Jesus. Now, you may never have heard that before, but it is important, it's a very important theological doctrine that your body is connected to the body of Christ. Verse 15 says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Flee sexual immorality. All of the sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. In other words, this is in a very special class of its own. It's a special sin, yes? as it were, um, because you're not only sinning against God, you're sinning against yourself. You see, sin by nature is, is going against God. So anytime we do something that's, that, that, that's wrong, it is wrong by virtue that God has said it's wrong. Yes, but with this one, we actually harm ourselves as well uh, in that. And so <clears throat> we've got to understand that. Now, the, you, you might say, well, how... how there's, I want to say to you that the, the, the body of Christ, the church, is connected to Christ. In some places, we talked about the, the bride of Christ. Yes? So let me just give you an analogy of, of like being um, Christ's body. Imagine me. I'm, I'm, I'm married to Kath. Now, if, um, I was to, uh, if somebody was to come to Kath and to slap Kath, would you think as a husband I would say, oh, that's all right, it's not me? No, because, you see, when we got married, there was a commitment, there's a connection, there's a joining, isn't there? Yes? Now, what I'm saying to you is, is that if somebody hurts you, they hurt Christ. That's why when you're persecuted, they're persecuting Jesus. 
That's why when they taunt you, they're taunting Jesus. Because they can't get to Jesus. He's too big, too powerful, too amazing, too awesome. He, he, can, he can only have to speak the word and they're gone. But to his bride, it's vulnerable. Yes, he's, he's protective, he's loving, he's caring. He's saying, this is my body. And he's wanting each one of us to look after our body as the bride of Christ. Amen? Amen. So the fifth one is, reason is the Holy Spirit lives in your body. This is a powerful thing. God puts his spirit in your body. Verse 19 says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? God has taken up residence in your life. Yes, he puts his spirit in your spirit. Yes, so today, you and I are the temple of God. You study history of God's interaction with humanity, and you see that God gave instructions to Moses to build a, ta uh, build a tabernacle. He showed him what designs, the dimensions, everything, and Moses did. And so God was in the temple, yes? And then later on, he gave directions to David on how to build the temple, and Solomon built the temple, his son, later. And so he, God dwelt in the temple. And today, he's not in any physical building. He's in you and I because we are his temple, that we are become his temple. Now, let me just ask you a question from that. If you were to see somebody vandalizing a church or a synagogue or some religious building and you saw them kind of uh, harming it, how would you respond? Well, you would probably respond by either trying to stop them and confront them, or you would maybe inform the police. How do we go about that when we vandalize our own body? Because it's the temple of God. So when we misuse and abuse our body, we realize that we're misusing and abusing the temple of God. That's powerful, isn't it? Um, that we should understand that. And sixthly, the last point, so it will last. <laughs> Stay with me now, okay? The last point is this, that Jesus bought your body on the cross. Verse 20, you are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Jesus bought your assets. He bought everything about you. If you want to know how much you're worth, look to the cross and see there that God was willing to send his son to die a most horrible, horrific death on the cross so that you and I could spend eternity with him. That's how much he loves us, that he was willing to die for us. That's how much he wants us to be in his family. That's how much he wants us to be in heaven with us. That's how much he loves us, is that. Let me ask you a question. If you owned a million dollar racehorse, would you feed it junk food? And yet, we have a body that is priceless. There's no amount of money can be put on our bodies. And yet, we misuse them. We feed them junk food, don't we? We feed them with all sorts of things. Paul says there, he says, I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices. Have you noticed there, it doesn't say offer your soul. It says offer your body. People say to me, I'll be there with you in spirit, pastor. Well, that means is they're not going to be there because you can only be where your body is. You can't be somewhere else, can you? Yes. Offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. The Daniel plan is about looking after what God has given us and realizing that how we treat our body is an act of worship. We need to realize that God is looking for how we look after our bodies so that they can be what God wants them to be. Amen? 
There are so many aspects that I wanted to go through. I've run out of time. But it's just so important that we realize that, that there are some things in Scripture that really are, that God says that if you will do these things, that, uh, that, that they will bring health to your body. And some of the things are not about food. They're not about, about, what, you, uh, about what you eat. Four things, for example... Proverbs chapter 3 talks about some of the things. It says, keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life. And it goes on. And there are four things that will help you to be healthy that you will not find in any diet book. First one is trusting God is good for your health. Yes. I said to myself, to, uh, the psalmist, relax because the Lord takes care of you. In other words, your stress level has gone down because you're trusting God. A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. It eats you from the inside out, doesn't it? Confessing your sin is good for your health. They say, Sam says there, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak and miserable and I groaned all day long. My strength evaporated. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them and you forgave me and all my guilt is gone. You know, instead of trying to stomach your problems, you know, trying to deal with them, because when you stomach your problems, your stomach, your stomach suffers. And we've got to realize that, that the guilt and the, and, the, and the hurts and the things that bitterness and the things that we hold on to us affects our health every time. Confessing your sin. You don't see that in any of the, <laughs> the, the Daniel plan, but I want to say to you, that is a health. That will do you good. Third one is giving generously is good for your health. The Psalm says 32, he says, when I refused to confess my sin, I was weak. Uh, sorry, <laughs> a generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. When you give, you take away the grip of materialism. And when you give, you will be refreshed. God promises that. Gener generous, but I want to say to you, miser and miserable are related words. If you want to be happy, be generous. If you want to be miserable, be a miser. Because that affects you. In, the, in your life. And the fourth thing is having fun. Have some fun is good for your health. A cheerful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. Amen. Today I want to leave with this. I believe today God wants us to rededicate our lives to him. To rededicate our bodies to him. To say to him today, Lord, this is your body. You bought it. You paid for it. You created it. You're the one that sustains it. You're the one that can give me the power. You're the one that gives me the breath to breathe. You're the one that gives me the blood running around. You give me the heart to pump. And it might not be all working very well at the moment because of the way I have not looked after it. But today, let's rededicate our lives to God and say, God, I give you my body. Yeah? You may have given him your spirit, you might have given him your soul, you might have given him your mind, but today, give him your body. Amen. Let's stand together and let's pray. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we just thank you that, Lord, that when we trust you, when we obey your commands, when we look to you, Lord, you change the way we are. We thank you, Lord, that today we can come and we confess together today that we have not looked after that which you have given us. Help us, Lord, today to honor you. Today, Lord, we rededicate our lives to you. Today, Lord, we say, have what is already yours. Father, we pray, help us, strengthen us, guide us, support us, so that, Lord, that we can live every moment in light, that, Lord, that we belong to you, that you've got a plan for our lives. And, Lord, we want today to be healthy. We, Lord Jesus, want to be healthy in body. We, Lord, we want to be healthy, wealthy, godly, uh, Lord, and wise. Give us the wisdom today, Lord, to, Lord, to, 
serve you with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul, and with all our strength. Lord, we can't serve you with all our strength unless, Lord, we live healthily. Help us, we pray today. I pray, Lord, for every single person here today that has prayed to rededicate their body to you, to say your, their body belongs to you, that they will look at it differently, act differently, think differently, eat differently, exercise differently. I pray, God, that you would honor them. I pray, Lord, today that you would fill them with your spirit. I pray, Lord, that not one person would leave here today or leave the online uh, service without, Lord Jesus, sensing your presence. We realize that this is all about you. And Lord, we are looking forward to version two. Lord, we recognize that this version one is always going to be decaying. It's always never going to be fully what you wanted and you created it to be. But we thank you, Lord, that as we honor you with what we have, we, know, we recognize, Lord, that in version two, Lord, that you're going to give us a super duper model. You're going to, Lord, revitalize us. And we thank you, Lord, that the things that we've done for you and how we've treated your body, what we have now, will be rewarded in heaven. So we look forward to those eternal rewards, not, Lord Jesus, to the earthly rewards that are fleeting, that pass so quickly. I pray this in the precious and lovely name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.